Welcome, everybody. So excited to have you here this cold fall morning in Experimental Weaving Lecture Series. We are extremely excited to have Patrice George here with us today. We're so honored and excited that she's going to be re-presenting with ex the expanded, we can say this is the director's cut version of her lecture from Praxis. Um, I, I just want to welcome you all. I know we have people from all over the world joining us this morning. If you folks uh, want to just say hi in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from, that would be super awesome. I'm going to hand the mic over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Laura Devendorf, who's gonna introduce Patrice and talk a little bit about some of our upcoming um, lectures that we have. We have two more in this series uh, that I cannot wait. Uh, don't forget to drop those hellos into our chat. Laura, take us away. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? That's my first. Cool. All right. Well, welcome uh, to the Experimental Weaving Talk Series presented live online from the Experimental Textiles course at CU Boulder, where Coach Prime is not attending, though maybe we'll invite him to come be a guest lecturer on the history of textiles for football. I did hear he made custom suits. Anyway. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Patrice George today. Um, I was maybe a little nervous, so I actually wrote an introduction, which is rare for me. So uh, I hope you don't mind if I read a little bit. But yeah, just to say we're really happy to welcome Patrice today. She has been a longtime member of the Complex Weaving Guild and really a leader for several decades in the development of woven structures in both her consulting work and her teaching at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, where she's now emeritus faculty. Uh, she's been a really kind of humble and quiet force behind a lot of really high profile initiatives advancing the integration of textiles and technology. So one example of that um, maybe you heard about is the MIT FIT collaboration program, which brought together fashion students and students from MIT to kind of envision new uh, like one of the topics was sustainable footwear, right? And developing new fibers and technologies for that. So she's really been a driving force behind a lot of innovation in textile structures and textile making. And maybe my favorite part is she strikes me as a bit of a weaving software nerd, much like myself. <laughs> um, so just to give a little context about why I invited Patrice, uh, I saw her give a short version of the talk I've asked her to give today at the Digital Weaving Conference, which took place this summer in Cleveland. And what I thought was so important about it is that we often hear that like, oh, did you know Jacquard Loom informed modern computing? And I think a lot of people say that and then kind of throw it away as a cute history, like, oh, that's cute. And now we've advanced and we do real technology now or something like that. And what I found so interesting about Patrice's talk is it really deepened that thread much closer to the present day, that this wasn't just something that Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage did. It was happening, which we'll hear with Janice Laurie, um, you know, within the last hundred years, last 50 years. And I think we see a lot of interesting inspiration for other possibilities of technology and innovation when we look at the way weavers approach it. And I just think this is a really beautiful history. And so I selfishly invited uh, Patrice to give this talk because I think it's important and it needs to be recorded and shared more widely. Um, so thank you, Patrice, for sharing this with us. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it straight over to you and then I will plug our upcoming talks in the series. We have two more after your talk, but I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Maybe we can do an in person round of applause because it sounds nice. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for this invitation. Um, of course, I was hoping to be there in person when you invited me. You said, Oh, I get to come to Colorado and play with all your toys. And then I thought, No, it's on Zoom again. But um, this is the first time I've ever given a Zoom talk that wasn't to my local students or my Scandinavian fiddle group or whatever else. So I've never been recorded for posterity before. So I'm a little nervous. So excuse me if that's 
which case and, and thank you, you can for also be edited for posterity if we need okay. <laughs> so. if, I, if I really blow it yeah um so uh I, it's it's really an honor to to be here I've, I've been watching um I've been following these talks I was so impressed with with last week's I mean it was just phenomenal uh so I I want to explain that this uh is a result of um my master's thesis. I, I actually have no formal training in weaving at all. Um, I'm from Michigan. I'm from, I'm a proud Wolverine. My major was art history, but um, I, during the process of going through school, I discovered weaving as I'd been introduced to it through the Henry Ford Museum as a kid, whatever. But I actually had a chance to sit and learn at a loom one weekend between my junior and senior year and my senior year, I flipped out, bought a loom, put it in my room and never went to class. I almost flunked out of school. I joined the Ann Arbor Weavers Guild instead. So um, fast forward, I went to India, thought that was a good place to learn to weave, spent a year in India, came back to Ann Arbor, um, started taking classes. I went, came out to Connecticut to study with Alan Fannin, who was at the time, he had a book called Hand Weaving Technology. Um, went back to Sweden where I'd been an exchange student in high school and studied uh, traditional Swedish weaving for several months in Stockholm. And that's what turned me into a techie nerd because um, Tying all those strings onto a wooden loom just drove me crazy. I'm a fourth generation engineer. So I figured there had to be some better way. So it took many years before computers caught up, but the Dobby loom was instantly something I discovered. And um, at, along the way, uh, as you'll see in my slides, I, I'll, I'll show you the history, but that, that's what happened. So the reason I chose um, as a master's degree textile history was because by the time I got around to getting a master's degree, I was already middle-aged and realized that most of the things I'd lived through were nobody knew. No one knew what I was talking about anymore. Um, the inventors and the, the developers that I'd, I'd worked with in the, in the early 80s were either retired or un unapproachable. Um, software and hardware had become so mainstream that we carried around in our pockets now. So um, I wanted to document all of the stages and, and many of the important people that I ran into in, in my trip. So that's that's what this will be. So even as, as I did it as an efficient, my thesis, which is available on ProQuest, if you want to look, it's called the Digital Dawn. Um, I forgot to put a link to it, but if you have ProQuest, you can find it, is based on a lot of primary and as many primary sources as I could find, but many of the primary sources were things in my own collection, you know, pamphlets and um, documents from all the conferences I went to over 40 years, uh, talks, interviews, old emails with, with clients and um, developers and whatever. So, so this is a, a very personal, although a, an academic presentation. So I'll just get into sharing my screen now and start my slideshow. Okay, so let me get this out of the way. Okay, so everybody can see this. So I figured since this is such a techie crowd, I would do something I'd never done before. I would develop something with artificial intelligence. So for my opening slide here, I used the text prompt prehistoric loom with computer in the style of Botticelli. Um, I was a little surprised at what AI thinks is prehistoric. <laughs> I guess it means pre 1600 <laughs> or post 1600. I, I expected to see a caveman with a, you know, some coconuts or something, but nope. So this is this is this is um, AI Arta's version of a prehistoric computer loom. Okay, let me get rid of this. Okay, so 
again, the evolution from traditional woven design and to mecha and mechanical production to computer aided design really began in the 1960s um, as the computer software and hardware were also developing it. As an aside, um, I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan, 1970. When I was in school, we had one computer on the campus. It was an entire building, and the entire building was 48K. So that's what I consider prehistory in this world. Um, so hand weavers really led this revolution because it was much easier to experiment on a hand loom, to prototype on a hand loom, to um, talk to hand weavers than to talk to industrial mega companies. I mean, when you when you think about the 60s and the 80s, we were in the age of the giant companies, the Burlingtons and the Field Crests. And um, these mills, these huge mills didn't do anything unless they could get an immediate return on investment. So the hand weavers and the hand weaving world and the early computer experimenters, the digital computer experimenters, really started to work together slowly. So we, if you follow computer conferences, you can see uh, beginnings of this in the, in the late 1950s and the 1960s, it really took off. Okay, okay so um, in 2020, um, Tufts University uh, and IBM had a show to honor Janice Lurie, who was a weaver and a musician. She went to Tufts. She actually studied uh, clarinet and was a pianist, a professional pianist for a while, I believe, and also had strong interest in weaving. Um, and she became an early programmer in the IBM lab that was developing computer graphics. And she, as a weaver, immediately saw that putting light dots on the screen was just like putting black dots on graph paper. So um, she developed with the IBM teams, but was actually instrumental in creating a software for computer graphics. And it was specifically for textile design for repeats. And that was the very first software that was patented by IBM. And that was unusual because until this point, IBM considered software just an accessory to their hardware. So to separate the software and the importance of the software programmer from the hardware was a monumental change in the history of computing. So her, her software was developed around using a light pen on, on the screen, or then it was called a CRT. It was a cathode, cathode ray monitor, cathode ray, cathode tube. I'm not sure exactly the right term, but um, the, the, the light pen, if the designer would work directly on the screen, the way we would work on a tablet now. So she was writing about this and presenting her research and her accomplishments at computer conferences in all through the 60s. The earliest papers I found were 1959, there was one, um, 66, uh, there's the um, ACM, I, I assume maybe you guys are familiar with this, the Association for Computing History has quite a digital library, which is a huge resource. And um, I found that Janice Lurie in 1966 was writing in Handweaver and Craftsman about the textile designer of the future and imagining what our world is today. So that was a, something that I never would have found if I hadn't written my paper. Um, so for, for computer-aided design, which I will refer to as CAD from now on, um, this was a huge milestone. And IBM was very happy to promote Janice and her accomplishments. She is over 90 now and is still working and in compute and compute and fusing computer science and her creative vision. And Tufts, in honor of this 50th anniversary, had a uh, an exhibit for her. And just as it opened, COVID hit. So 
I could never see it. I haven't been able to meet Janice in person. Um, I did talk to here. I have a source from Laura Ferguson, who interviewed and wrote the all of the documentation for the thing and interviewed Janice. I've been in close in touch with Laura, so she's been my connection to Janice. So I put, I put the links where I can put links. I put them in the slides here. So if you view the recording later, you can you can find them and go ahead. So this is Janice. Um, she again, she was a weaver who was collaborating with the engineers, but obviously she was a programmer herself. She really understood the technology of her time. And but her passion was to connect it to not just weaving, but also to knitting and all the textile arts, to knitting and printing too, and and graphic design. So in 1968, this was my first introduction to it. I remember seeing an ad or uh, something in one of those glossy magazines that used to come with the Detroit Free Press of this jacquard loom that was being shown at the World's Fair in Texas. And this was the jacquard loom. This was the very first digital jacquard loom connected to one of these CRTs that you could draw on by hand. And people came to the, the fair, could actually try out drawing something on the screen and having it woven right away, which is what we can do now with a TC2. But this is 1968. It was a huge hit, um, got lots of great publicity and um, really inspired a lot of other graphic people working in the graphics area to explore more this, this possibility of not only connecting, doing digital work on a screen, but connecting it to pro existing modified production equipment. So this is a little bit of a timeline from that point. Um, going back, since we're starting with hand weaving, um, in the 1970s, four to eight shafts were the most common, um, especially in the Scandinavian weaving traditions were the, probably the most influential in the United States because of the huge Scandinavian immigrant population in the Midwest and in, in the Western um, United States and Seattle and Oregon. And um, the, and the East Coast was more industrially oriented and more Anglo, you know, British oriented, but still four to eight shafts were the, the mainstream in the weaving world. In the early 70s, computers were just mainstream. So if you weren't working for IBM, you didn't have access to them or even understand what they were. Um, they were being used primarily for production, data management, uh, jacquard looms, before there was a jacquard loom interface, there was uh, some, inter some computerized card cutting because jacquard looms were originally programmed by cutting cards with holes in them. And every hole represented a thread that would be up or down and it ran over a series of hooks. So the digitization of the jacquard loom required replacing those cards with electronic, you know, solenoid connections that would hit those hooks instead. So that was, it was exactly the same process, but electronically, but that was a huge, huge engineering problem. Um, many schools had textile degree programs, but they tended to be either in art education or art therapy or, um, yeah, just fiber arts in general. So and the, the tech side of, of weaving had not yet hit the academic world. Um, I found out later that uh, I didn't know this, that the, the first computer graphics course at FIT, which was apparently the first computer graphics course in the country, was taught by Janice Lurie herself. And I am still trying to figure out through our special collections where our data is on that. <laughs> I have not been able to find anything in the school that documents this except for a catalog from 1972-73, which lists Janice as one of the teachers of our first computer graphics courses. 
Um, at the end of the 1970s, we saw the first uh, U.S. made Dobby loom for Dobby hand loom at ADL. Uh, Aaron's and Violet Looms in California made the first Dobby in 1977. And uh, the design of that Dobby made it very easy to add a computer control to it later on in the 1980s. And I wanted to shout, shout out to um, this book that inspired me to this career, which was Alan Fannin's Handweaving Technology. He was the first person, at least in the 20th century, to share all the secrets or tricks of the trade of the industrial weaver with hand weavers. And he was appreciated by some weavers and hated by others. I loved him. So a little bit about what looms looked like pre-digitization. Uh, so um, this is my very first weaving experience in 1965. I was a 16-year-old exchange student to Sweden. And um, I was visiting a family who was a friend of the family I was living with. And the woman discovered that I could neither knit or weave and thought I was an idiot. So she sat me down at her loom, which had a beautiful, very fine linen curtain on it, and said, here, weave. So if you notice there, there's light coming in the window. And I like to say that is St. Vevna, the sweet Swedish god of weaving, who came down and blessed me and said, you are stuck for the rest of your life. In 1972, I returned to um, Sweden after I graduated from the University of Michigan and took a course at a school called Handa Svenner, which is a very traditional school. And this is where I learned to hate those things on the right, a contramarche loom that's all tied up with strings. And at Handa Svenner, they would make us take all of those ties off and put them back on between each project, which took a lot of time. We could have been weaving instead. So I loved the weaving. I hated the strings. So this is uh, one of the few pictures that I know of, and I, I took this in California. This is John Violette and Aaron's and Jim Aaron's, the Aaron's and Violette of AVL Looms. Um, this is 1977. And this was Jim's studio in Oakland, California. And Jim Aaron's was a weaver and an engineer and a tinkerer. And he made he just kept reinventing looms. He was going back to 19th century manuals and looking at things that he thought were interesting. But he did work with, with John Violette and um, came up with this wonderful Dobby system, and Dobby is contraction for draw boy, that replaced treadles underneath the loom with a rolling uh, cylinder and wooden bars with pegs in them. And so you could pre-program a pattern for a shaft loom and weave it continuously. And the design of this loom, if previously Dobby looms systems had always sat on top of the loom, this one was side mounted. And that's what made it perfect later on when they came along and started to develop a computer interface for it. All you have to do in an AVL loom is move this roller out and put in the CompuDobby, the electronic box with solenoids, and it fits right in. And many of us know that when your CompuDobby fails, you can always put your roller back and weave mechanically. So that's one of the beauties of this particular loom. So this is how uh, we design. This is this is from my studio. This is our design sheet. So, so designing for the Dobby loom um, was all manual. This is what I learned from Alan Fannin. Um, how to analyze the fabric, how to look at structures. Um, other books that were really important were uh, the Olsner and Dale Handbook of Weaves, which I memorized every page of. And um, I would spend hours just working on graph paper, developing these little designs going, wow, how many things can you do on, 16, on a 16 by 24 grid? You know, this is amazing. With no idea that I would do anything else ever except work with those chains. So on the way to waiting for the inventions, I uh, advertised in Handweaver and Craftsman to see if I could find a, uh, a an old mechanical Dobby loom. And I found one in East Chicago, New York. Somebody answered my ad. So this, this was a hybrid of an old industrial Dobby loom. This is, we called it Zeus. This is the Dobby on top. It only had 40 bars. This is when I still lived in Ann Arbor, so I had this took up my entire living room. 
Um, and once I started working with this, I said, well, you know, the, the craft scene in Ann Arbor doesn't really appreciate this. I think I'm going to move to New York <laughs> and try to get a job. So I moved to New York got a job at a, a mill called Kohama Decorative Fabrics almost immediately um, and worked there for four years where I had plenty of experience uh, designing for Dobbies and working with a mill that was all Dobby looms and Jacquard looms. And in, after four years of that, I was getting a lot of um, inquiries about freelance work. So I decided to leave my full-time job and freelance and that led to having my own studio for 1979, really until now, although it's not as active as it used to be. I used to have five or six weavers working for me. So 1974, I got this loom. The first AVL loom was that I had was 1979. That was two years after the company was founded. Um, the reason I got in touch with AVL was they found me. They heard that there was somebody in New York with a Dobby loom and they wanted to know who I was. So they, John Violette came to visit me and I got my first loom in 1979, um, the second one in 1980, the third one in 1981. You can see this was a very successful business doing prototypes of handwoven fabrics for industry. And in 1983, um, they had developed with Tim Trudell, who is from Vancouver, uh, their first computer interface system. I beta tested that in California in, in the early 80s and installed it in my own studio in 1984. So again, quick timeline. Um, the interface to looms would not have been possible unless personal computers had come about. So this is a huge connection that most people don't take for granted now. Um, but the first computers, um, there were the, the Commodore and there was, uh, I forget all the, all the ones, the Atari was out there. They were basically gaming computers. But the Apple is the one that really made a huge difference for a lot of weavers, the first Apple. Um, their, their function originally was for the, the, the VisiCalc was the original Excel. <laughs> Mitch Capers program. Um, so that calculating program and the very early graphics programs, which were basically just graphing programs, um, were what made it possible for weavers who were also computer scientists to put the two together and start to make something that was marketable to the home and craft weaving and education market. So in 1983, Three. This is a very, very pivotal, important year. Um, there's a, a, a convention, International Convention of Textile Machinery. So, so that's International Textile Machinery Association, ITMA. In 1983, it was in Milan. And AVL invited me to come with them to help um, demonstrate their new computer interface loom. It was the first computer interface loom at ITMA. And it was the last wooden loom shown at ITMA. So that was really the moment where things started to change, where the industry and the weaving world started to connect. Um, Bonus, an English company, did have their first electronic Dobby power loom at ITMA in 1983, but they didn't really have design software to go with it. Somebody may be able to correct me on that, but I don't recall. I remember they had an electronic power loom, but I'm not sure what software they had running it. Um, another thing I'm going to mention is uh, once this started in 1983, the, the world just exploded, the world of, of um, weaving and textiles and the possibilities for the future exploded. So a lot of conferences to bring together all the st stakeholders, the designers, the ad academics, the industrial people started to develop um, exchanges of information to try to figure out how to work together. So um, yeah, and the hand looms, I'll look, I'm gonna get onto some pictures in a minute. Um, by the, the, the late 70s, early 80s, not only AVL, but Maycomber, Schacht, Arm, a, a European company, I think it was German and TIS, a French company, all had developed uh, interfaces for hand looms and 
some kind of software to run them. So some of our early software, and these, these are the ones that are not always, I, I can't always read the files anymore. Generation two was the first one from AVL. Fiberworks was early. Uh, Fiberworks has been an evolving program from the 1980s by Bob Keats in um, Toronto. And is is this is Fiberworks is a hand weaver's favorite. Hand weavers who have nothing to do with academia or um, industry love Fiberworks because it's filled with extra little features that weave in weaver language and hand weaver language. That, they, that it's also a very good program. Um, ProWeave was another early program for um, Mac and Patternland. So two things that that have were around for a while but did not stay along but they were they were all very popular in the early 80s and in in the weaving world um let me give a shout out to point carré which was is a french program it was um introduced by messon and roussel olivier messon is still very active and has a blog and a page if anybody wants to go into the whole history of point carré but that was the first fully graphical weaving software from macintosh and that was introduced in 1985. So in 1983, at this ITMA, they weren't ready, but it, they two years later, they they were fully up and running. Um, almost immediately, uh, we saw textile schools pick up on this this equipment, both here and in Europe. I want to give a special shout out to Alan Donaldson, who was a uh, the professor of the first design professor of um, electronic textiles at North Carolina State, uh, S School of Visual Arts, where I taught, started a computer aided woven design and print design program in 1984, um, 1984, I believe, or 19, 1986, I think it was Toronto. HGA, the Hand Weavers Guild of America, had a big conference and introduced uh, many new and updated. That was the year that weavers really exploded in terms of being aware of all the new software that was out there. And in 1988, um, the academic world really came together in Finland when uh, the used to be called uh, <laughs> the School of Industrial Arts Helsinki, now it's called Alto University, um, had a an international conference in 1988, and that really brought together um, all the things going on in Europe and all the things going on in the States for probably the first time. So here's some pictures of the, the AVL progress here. This was 1983, um, showing the, the original you know, Dobby Loom with its mechanical interface. And this was the first um, electronic interface. When I first met it, the, there was a computer here, but most of the parts and the components were on a um, table. We're on a we're on a card table. So in 1983, when they took me out to California to test this out, it took me about 20 minutes to put in a long program, and then it the, the visual display wasn't much, and it was like eh, this isn't really saving much time over you know, pegging it manually, I can see where it's going. But in 1984, I went back out. And by that time, the software and the interface were both fully developed. And it took me 20 minutes to do something that would have taken me two hours by hand. And I said, okay, give me the invoice, I'll pay for it. I'll come. This was John Violette at that it met that I mentioned in 1983, where we were the first um, complete computer interface Dobby and the last wooden loom. It was really funny because all of the um, big industry people, the Bonus and the Stoll, and, um, Dornier, all the, the big names in the computer industry world came over and looked at me, this little girl, and said, oh, would you open up that box and show me how it works? I said, no. <laughs> you guys figure it out. <laughs> I'm here showing a hand loom. Why, why are you guys asking me how this box works? Don't you understand it? So there was a lot of miscommunication going on. This was uh, 1984. Once the 
generation two on the original Mac um, was out. They AVL put out this beautiful promotional flyer to explain what was going on with all the system requirements. So you need, this was by now an Apple II, at least one disk drive, a suitable monitor, a compatible printer, which meant, you know, a black and white digital printer with the little pin feeds on the side. And again, the hand weaving world was following this very long ago. Remember Janice Lurie had in 19... 66 already alerted hand weaver and craftsman that this was coming. So this in 1983, Carol Strickler, who was another very um, prominent weaving educator and writer and uh, function, structural function person, um, she was already keeping track of all of the software that was available for weavers in 1983. So this is before we have computer interface looms, software is out there for these early computers. Just to show you what screens used to look like. Um, no matter what I see on a screen now, if it's AI or the most amazing si simulation, nothing will ever compare to the first time I used this program and could put in one repeat and suddenly see everything repeat and change it. and. It was like suddenly my brain was attached to the computer without the, the keyboard. It was, and this black, this green and black screen was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen because it made me realize what I had in my mind. It was connected to my loom as long as my loom was set up with a special draw and draft. If you're weavers, I could do it, you know. So um, I, still go back to this moment whenever I'm sitting at a computer, no matter what, how fancy the loom or how advanced the software. In 1984, um, shout out to Interweave Press in Colorado. Um, Linda Ligon invited me to write an article about what I was doing with computers in AVL. So this was an article that I, I really love. It's the only sketch I've ever done in my life. I'm not a I'm not an artist. I'm totally a, a hands-on, like build, you know, Lego blocks kind of person. But you can see the computer here is what, the, what is that a Commodore? Anyway, that's not my computer, that's theirs. But for this article, I did a collection of fabrics like showing once you have one special setup on your loom, how you can easily do variations. So this was the little collection I designed for. Um, interweave and this is really what I've done all my life is design collections for commercial clients and this is a commercial client uh, in the same year who wanted to show how advanced they were so in showing this fabric is a cubicle cloth it's the kind of fabric that goes around um, a hospital bed for privacy that was one of my specialties so they showed uh, the, the hand woven fabric. It didn't say it's hand woven, but it was. And the bobbins and the printout from generation two as part of their uh, publicity campaign for, the, for this collection. So as a really important um, early feature, I wanted, mention this project because this is, is one that really changed uh, the world too in terms of the industry adopting new technologies. Karistan was the largest uh, carpet maker in the world and Iconix was, it was actually a division of Kodak and they had been to ITMA, they had been following all the computer things and they said, okay, it takes us about two years to develop a new industrially woven oriental rug to hand do the patterning, to paint the pattern out, to cut the jacquard cards, to sample the, the yarn colors. It was all a very, very difficult process. So they started to work, they developed a collaboration with Iconics. They built their own hardware um, they scanned with a video camera. So this is, this is the first scanner I'd ever seen. It was um, a video camera that traveled on a track over this real oriental carpet 
to document every single knot in the carpet. And then they could take it to software and, and a color screen and edit that, save it, print out large pieces so they could take it to customers and perfect the colors before they dyed them. Um, it was amazing. It cost them several, at least several million dollars to develop this system, but they increased their development. I think the first year they said they did, instead of two new designs, they did four. The second year they had the system running, instead of four designs, they did like 24. The third year, instead of 24, they did like 84. And by the fourth year, this entire system was obsolete. But they had made so much and learned so much in the process that they really paved the way for other industrial people to make the investment because these big companies didn't want to invest in things they didn't think would give a return. But, but Karastan proved that this technology not only saved a human, made their designers have more time to be creative, made it possible to make more product, to get more product to the market, to make, make a more perfect product because there was more in between interaction with the customer. So this is a report on that from the textile world in 1986 on that partnership. Then I want to mention a few um, hand weavers who were very influential too. And I, I can't even begin to cover everybody. There's so many people, but these are the people I knew and was in connected with. Sheila O'Hara, who probably many of you know is a designer from Oakland. She was, um, working on 16 harness looms on Dobby looms and developed this method of switching her shafts as to, to make one row here, she would like treadle like 25 times you know, to get these different blocks up. And I've never understood how Sheila does this. This is Sheila's brain, but she was doing things like this on a 16 shaft Dobby, mechanical Dobby before there were computers, before there was software, before there was um, a computer interface and before there were jackards. So I just wanna give a shout out to Sheila for um, her amazing work. I know she inspired a lot of other people to um, do more graphic designs on treadle looms, on shaft looms. She's still very active of, and um, it, in 2008, I think if you go to the archive of, of Handwoven Magazine, she did a really nice article on her transition from shaft loom weaving to jacquard weaving. But this this was amazing. Everybody was looking at this in the early 1980s saying, that's jacquard. And she said, no, it's not. I'm just, and then she'd do her Sheila explanation of what she was doing. And she tried to take workshops. I don't know of anybody else who ever actually learned Sheila's method of creating these graphics, but she was certainly influential when people were able to start doing graphics on computer interface jackards. Um, some other early, uh, again, this is how the word about this technology got spread. In 1985, the Folk Art Museum in New York City had a show on American coverlets, which is about as traditional as you can get. And they were both done on, they had the beautiful collection that were both done on shaft looms, but also done on jacquard looms that were done by professional weavers who would travel around and take orders and do coverlets for people. So they contacted AVL because they'd heard about this computer loom. AVL sent them to me and they said, um, we'd like you to come and bring your computer and show people how somebody would design a coverlet today. I said, great, that sounds like fun. My cat, they sent a, a beautiful photographer, a wonderful photographer. My cat got in the picture, became the most famous cat in weaving history. And um, I took my computer to the, to the um, event and they said, oh, by the way, we can't pay you, but we will put an article in the New York Times. That's why I'm here today, that that article in the New York Times was sent out across the, the UPI network. Um, I got a call from the School of Visual Arts saying, uh, we want to teach this course. So he said, I can't teach a course. <laughs> all I did was buy a computer and use it. They said, that's all right. You're the only one in New York. Learn, learn to teach and in six months, we're going to give you a course. So that began my educational career. And this is my famous cat, Nadja. We 
interpreting her pose on the computer, which she loved. So while all of this is developing, personal computers are going rapidly forward too. So this is a ad from 1985 of what was available. IBM finally got in the market with their PC. Mac is improving. Um, so there becomes a big competition between the Apple people and IBM people. Color monitors came later. At first, we were all dealing with those black and white or black and green screens. Color monitors were very um, important, but they were very slow in the beginning. This particular color monitor in my studio, uh, when I got my first color version of my software, it took 45 minutes to upload that color image onto the screen. I'd basically do it before dinner, come back after dinner and check it out. So, um, and printers, it took another few years before color printers, digital ink printers were available. So in the meantime, AVL sends me this color plotter, which architects love. It just draws straight lines. So it could do drawings of um, weavings, but it, so there you see my PC. I, I now moved from the Apple to the PC for the color monitor, but to a color printer, I had to have a plotter. And this is another uh, one of the first color programs was from Scotland, the Scott Weave program developed in Glasgow, I believe. And that was also a very important thing for, for that industry. It, uh, the tartan industry is totally dependent on color. Um, variations being able to simulate color before developing a new tartan was a huge deal. Some early designs done with... Uh, on the IBM PC program when, when we had the color monitor. So these were images, these are actual fabrics, but this is, this is an image of a fabric that I could see on the screen. So color changed things immense, immensely for the industry. It may, meant that you could prototype, send pictures or invite people in to look at your screen to help develop a new product. Other things that were developed at this period. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Jane Barnes who was developing things at the same time. Jane was a student at FIT who founded her business with a loan from one of her science teachers, I think her biology teacher. And um, she was started as a fashion student and had a really unique sense of design, but a real strong interest in textiles. So as soon as she bought her first loom in 1979, I believe, and um, started playing with color and just wonderful pattern, abstract patterns, uh, she went on to develop um, software. She didn't develop the software, but there was a company called Designer Software that had a weave program called Weave Maker. And Jane spent a lot of time customizing that software with the the with the owners. And really, that was a gift to everybody. It was one of the first softwares that could do three D um, simulations. At a low level, not not on, on high level equipment, but it it's an amazing software that has a lot of automatic al algorithms that help you to make fancy twills and big designs and stuff. So this has been the main software I've taught with in my courses at FIT for many years. I want to mention a few books. I mean, we're running low on time, so I'll try to go faster here. Um, this is uh, Janice Lurie's work was finally published as a book in 1973, which was also the same year that um, FIT started its original computer graphics programs. Um, this is Messon and Rizel's book, Tissage Alam. Um, it was published in 1987, but it was built on work that they'd been doing for a very long time together and also influenced by the work of Henri Lazenik, who was a, another Weaver computer person who um, was a big fan of the Apple. So this is a very, very influential book. Uh, Digital Jacquard design was developed, is, as far as I know, this is the only um, comprehensive book that doesn't specifically relate to any particular software or equipment. Uh, it was written by Juliet Holyoke, who is an author at the Alicia Foundation, which is one of the places in Europe. This is where everybody went to learn jacquard design and 
probably is still very, very important. They offer online courses now. You can take online courses. It, but Alicio uh, taught traditional silk weaving, very, you know, Renaissance level um, silk weaving. And this is a very incredible book, both for history and for technology. 1987 ITMA, four years after the original explosion. This was the this was the year that everybody had something digital. The knitters, the weavers, the embroiderers, every CAD CAM, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing had reached every corner of the industry. And this is when all of the mills and producers of the world really started to invest heavily by now that it was proven technology and schools started who taught for industry started to invest. So I call 1987 the year of the investor. One of the main software programs at, from this era, not the only one, but um, one of the most popular was Sophus out of Belgium. They were the, one of the first to have a really, really excellent simulation program. And uh, they were also one of the first to scan in a photograph and then assign weaves based on the kind of weaving you wanted to do. So these were some examples that they showed at um, of their process and the finished product at Itman 87, this beautiful you know, Primavera and this eye here. So they were a huge, huge development. I, they don't exist anymore, but they've been purchased. I'm not sure which of the made big companies they have been absorbed into. But um, this was Anne and Carl Noonan over here, the uh, founders of that. This was a company I worked with demonstrating what the SOFA system could do for them. This was a hand-drawn sketch. It was scanned into the SOFA. This is the scan, and this is the printout with all the weave structures in place, which then connected directly to the loom or the, or the card cutter in this case. They didn't have a digital loom yet. So this is how the design process changed. Another company I worked with that had a SOFA system um, scanned in photos of the mill and their staff for um, a gift for their owner and made a duvet cover for him for his 50th birthday. So this is, SOFA's was really the introduction of the scanning of photograph and assigning weaves, things which we also take for granted now. So just some really quick, since this is an educational thing, I wanted to show what I found not in the FIT archives, but in the American Computing Archive. I actually found pictures of the first computer lab at FIT in 1972, which I am going to donate to our special collections and going to continue to search to find, don't we have some pictures too? Um, so this equipment was apparently the equipment that had been in the 1968 World's Fair that IBM worked with FIT to install in our school. And they developed a 15 module course for all levels of integrating computer technology into textile design. So this is the Dobby monitors. You can see it's still using the light pen. There is that loom. It's definitely that loom that was in the hemisphere. I have no idea what happened to it. If anybody knows, please let me know. I'm on the track here. Um, student work. Shout out to Alan Donaldson, who started, not only was very influential in building up the program at NC State, but he also was the founder of this CAD CAM conference, which went on for about five years. This was from the 1985 uh, program. You can see who was here. Wolfgang was a professor at uh, Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science, now Jefferson um, Iconics. This was where we first learned about the uh, Karistan program. I spoke about AVL. So School of Visual Arts, who invited me to teach. We started in 1984. And that course, the first course I taught there was filled with people from, with professors from other colleges. I went home and cried and told my husband, if I was, if I applied to this course, I couldn't get in, but I'm the teacher. I'm scared to death. But we all became friends. RISD, another very important school, um, had always had industrial jacquard looms in 1991. They uh, up and they had industrial Dobby looms. 
they slowly converted the equipment they had to computer interface looms. Um, also working with IBM, they set up a really important big lab, IBM funded in 1991. Shout out to Vibeka, who isn't here today, I believe, but we all know her as the inventor of the and producer and spokesperson for the TC2. But this is where she started when I met her. Um, I visited Norway in 1994 and she was still teaching at the art college in Oslo and trying and working with government grants to um, digitize existing Norwegian looms. She wrote a little program called Weave Planner. And this is Vibeka and I with professors from um, the Helsinki School at the conference in 1988, the International Conference on Computer Aided Design and Academia. So this is the first TC2 prototype in 1994. This is the TC1 in 2007. And you all know the TC2 because we have it there in the lab. Shout out to Alison Bakhti, who wrote The Woven Pixel and taught us how to use Photoshop to the biggest advantage to design for Dobby's and Jackhards. Shout out to Catherine, who I hope you all know, who has been um, I met first met Catherine when she was a student at Eastern Michigan University. She was a student of Pat Williams, another pioneer. And Catherine has gone to be a genius artist and the spokesperson, installer, trainer for um, TC2 and the coordinator of the Praxis Fiber Workshop. And just the very last to just say that finally, after all this time, um, I finally got a TC2 at FIT after trying to lobby for one for a very long time. We got it in uh, 2021, in the middle of the pandemic. We were able to buy the demo TC2 out of storage, and it took us about six months to renovate it because it had been used all over the country. But this is one of our students very happily working on it. And this, these are some examples of the first time I was able to teach a class how to do jacquard design on Photoshop, and we didn't have time for everybody to weave a big piece. So we just had 18 inch loom and six inch, everybody had a six inch square. And so this is what students who had been trained in Dobby weaving, but had their first experience with the TC2 did their first time out. And I was so very proud of them. So I will end there. My last slide is a picture of an amazing project that could not have been done without a computer. It was a recreation of a 19th century gold curtain for the Bolshoi Ballet um, done in uh, 2007 to 2011. It took three years. It was a very complicated project. You can look this up online too, but I just wanted to show the, um, the huge difference between this giant, huge, you know, 12 foot high repeat for a theater curtain. Originally, this had been done on a draw loom and recreating something that had been done with humans and human brains and human hands on a digitally interfaced modern loom was quite a, an accomplishment. And it just shows how far we have come. Um, but we can't forget that it's the human brain, the human hand, the human ingenuity that is behind this incremental development that we all are able to take advantage of today. So I possibly run over a little bit, but I hope I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. And with another AI, uh, this um, was robot weaving on a jacquard. So this, this is another one of my, um, new uh, AI illustrations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel there's a fruitful series and maybe we need an Instagram channel just for AI generated weaving prompt imagery. Might be. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Patrice. That was really lovely. And thanks for coming and sharing it again. I'm gonna turn it over to Steven who will moderate the Q&A portion. Okay. Uh, Steven, take it over. Hey, thank you so much, Laura and Patrice. Thank you so much. I just was like, 
every image I was like, I want this image. I want this image. As I'm looking through these pieces, there's so much amazing archival work that you've done. And I appreciate all this, uh, putting all this information together. I'm still just absorbing it. And I'm so glad this was recorded so I can watch it again uh, in a little bit. Um, so Patrice, uh, and anybody has any questions for Patrice, please put them right into the chat. We're really excited um, to see them there. Um, one of my quick questions for you, you know, that we have you here, I, I'm really interested in some of the kind of um, controversies or some of the blowbacks that maybe came inside of the introducing digital weaving, if there were any, um, because it just seems like it's such an interesting, you know, Weavers, literally Luddites are weavers, like the Luddites were weavers, right? So I know sometimes it can be really difficult to adapt these new technologies. I'm just interested in some of the conversations you may have had and, and how you brought people into the fold with digital weaving. Oh, wow. That's another hour and a half. <laughs> the, the first was, but I'm a hand weaver. I don't want to use that of anything, any, anything automatic. It's not automatic. <laughs> You're still weaving by hand. I mean, because remember, this was in the hand weaving world before it was in the industrial world. So people just assumed this was industrial. It's like, no, it's not. So I remember at that very first SVA class, when I had all these professors around me, I mean, some of the people like Carol Westfall from Montclair State was there. Bhakti Zeke was in that class, if you know Bhakti, but she wasn't a professor yet. She was just a student. Bhakti came wanting to know if she could throw a shuttle and not have the color appear from selvage to selvage. So we knew Bhakti was special right there. <laughs> this is before Jack. She's trying to do this on a Dobby. Um, somebody, the, the professor from Washington State. So they're all going, how is this working? And the, the loom in the corner, visual arts bought this loom and we all had these old computers, the old Macs. And um, they couldn't understand, no one in the class could understand how the computers connected to the loom. And so I said, well, it's all electronics. And so I took, I, I brought a technician and we took the computer apart and said, there's no moving parts in the computer. You know, it's, it's sending signals to the CompuDobby. And it, it wasn't until I opened the computer and showed people there were no little magic munchkins in there doing something that they understood what was going on. But my other favorite one was I was invited to Nova Scotia. Um, I don't remember what year it was. It was probably in the early 90s. But uh, OK, so Nova Scotia <laughs> was uh, very cold. Um, and it was the Robin Miller, who was a very young professor at the time. And um, I did a workshop on computer-aided design, just, just on the computer-aided design. They had a loom. But these old. Uh, Nova Scotian tartan weavers were there and they were just sitting back going, who needs this? Who needs anything but a tartan? We don't need anything else. So we said, but look, you can change the color of your tartan without having to dye all the yarn all over again. And we pull up the screen and show them and they go, oh, maybe this is useful. <laughs> So, and that, that article I did for um, Handwoven in 1984, that was specifically targeted. Linda asked me to do that for the doubters. And that actually got a lot of positive feedback. So, but it, it, it really, it, it took a village. I mean, everybody who was working in this area, all the weavers who were early um, mentors worked with their guilds. It was really a ground level movement forward among weavers. And like I said, it was in 1983 and 1987 that really exploded in the industry. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate all the work that you did there and all the work you've done. It's just amazing, Patrice. I love seeing this so much. And like, oh yeah, then I was at this place and I did this amazing thing. It's just so awesome to see this. Um, I hope this becomes a book. I'll just say that out there. If anybody has ideas. Okay. Yeah, well, if <laughs> most of the illustrations are also in the appendix to my thesis. Um, Again, I'll, I'll type the name of my thesis and you can look it up. It's available on ProQuest. If you, if through college, you can get the ProQuest. I don't know, it's, but my thesis is called The Digital Dawn. I'll, um, I'll link it in the YouTube video notes uh, so people can find it there, Patrice. Um, and I'll link it there so people can go and do it. We have one question from our guest today and then I will hand it over to Laura. Uh, Jeff asked a really good question here. Uh, did any of the early Dobby systems have a manual interface like buttons or switches to control the solenoids? Yes, um, the arm loom did. I, I believe it was the arm loom. 
um, yes, one, one of the European looms did have, it, it had its own built-in computer. It didn't have, it didn't connect to an outside computer and um, you could, you could program it directly and it would weave directly without having to get an external PC or Mac. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. We are a little bit over time today. I'm going to hand over the floor to Laura to do a few announcements. And then please do uh, follow us on Instagram, our Unstable Design Lab Instagram. Also go over to our YouTube channel and you can see past lectures. Um, also on our website, on Unstable Design website, you can see that and send over your friends to sign up for our next talk, which is what Laura is going to talk about. Yes, and right. thank you to all my friends who are out there. I can't say hi to each of you individually, but I see several names and faces I know. So really happy to see you. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Patrice. And that was really lovely. And we'll do another round of applause just because there's, yeah, I always find sometimes giving talks online. It's nice to see that humans are in places and have bodies, <laughs> you know, not just, you know, from the head up. Um, but yeah, I just love to um, announce we have two more talks in the talk series. We had a bit of a longer pause between our first talk by Elizabeth and this talk today. The next two will come with about two weeks between each. Our next talk will actually be by Lucy Smith on November 8th, um, which you know you might think they're knits, but they're not. They're wovens and somehow she gets them to do curvaceous things that are unthinkable. And I'm really excited to learn more about her process. Um, yeah, so on that note, I will say thank you to everyone for joining today. And we hope to see you again in the future. Um, Patrice, we probably are gonna move on. I have to get these students ready for their final. And so I will have them direct questions to you by email if that's okay. Absolutely. But okay. You can perfect. Call me anytime. Okay. Thank thanks so much. Okay. Um, thanks. And thanks everyone for coming and have a great day. Thank you all. Enjoy your day. Great. Thank you.